All right, well, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 4, fourth chapter in the Gospel of John. We made it down to verse 39 the last time together, so we're going to be picking it up in verse 40, and we'll endeavor to put a wrap on this wonderful, wonderful chapter tonight. Now, in this country, we are into announcements, right? I mean, we spend truckloads, boatloads of money on announcements. They're just very important to us. Can you imagine if you had all of the money that was spent in just one year in this country on wedding announcements alone? And we put great thought into them, right? I mean, we feel as if the announcement somehow sort of sets the stage for the success of whatever it is that we're announcing. And of course, politicians, right? I mean, they will very carefully craft how and where they're going to announce their candidacy, right? And the interesting thing I find about announcements is this idea that we consider it very important where in that information chain we happen to fall because that sort of develops kind of a pecking order, does it not? I mean, if somebody says, hey, I've got this big announcement, and man, I want you to be the first one to know. Well, that's a pretty indi- a good indication, is it not, that you're pretty important to that person, right? But if you're like the 400th person to find out about the deal, you're nobody, right? Now, can you imagine, again, in the eternal counsels of God, here is the Godhead, right? Here is, here is the Father, here is the Son, here is the Spirit, and they are devising this plan of redemption. They are, are devising how they will redeem lost man, and that lost man is going to forever inform all of creation of the long-suffering and the mercy of of God, right? That in God's dealing with the church, it's not just for us, but it is for all creation. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that God will be showing his kindness through his grace towards us throughout the ages to come. Ephesians 2, 7. That should there ever arise from some corner of the universe the accusation that, well, God is not merciful or or God is not long-suffering or God is not just, he's going to be able to point to the church and say, well, if I'm not gracious, tell me why these guys are here, right? And if I'm not merciful, could you explain these people to me? So here's the, here's the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They're putting the, together this, this fantastic plan of redemption. They're putting together this wonderful plan of salvation. And at some point, they must have come to the point where they said, Well, who are we going to tell first with this big announcement? I mean, who is going to be on the receiving end? The first one to be on the receiving end that Jesus is the Messiah. And probably just to blow our minds, the father said, all right, I got it. This is going to be good. There's going to be this woman in Samaria, right? This home wrecker. Nobody's going to want anything to do. Let's make her the first one. Now, again, the first person that you give that big announcement to, indication that that person is pretty important to you and this should be what a tremendous encouragement to you and I that here is this woman right living this disastrous life among a rejected people and she is the first one to hear from the mouth of Christ I I am the Messiah I am the savior savior of the world I who speak to you am he John 4 26 right The question was asked in the Q&A last week, why a Samaritan? Because God is no respecter of persons. Romans 2.11, God does not play favorites. And to make that point with striking force, we have the account of the Samaritan woman as a very deliberate object lesson to you and I on this very point, right? She is the very kind of person that Christ came for, Mark 2.17. That's why it was the Samaritan women. 
And this woman, she's filled with such excitement, and she's blown away, runs back into town, and she begins to tell people, come, you have got to see this guy that knows everything about me. John 4, 29. So she comes into town, not only as the first to receive the big announcement, right? But she really becomes what? The first evangelist. You remember she was immediately activated as a servant of Christ. No membership classes. No probationary period. She hasn't read one Josh McDowell book, right? She's not trained in apologetics. And she was used to a greater degree than all of the disciples combined. You remember they were in the very same village just a few moments getting, uh, just a, a few moments before this, this, this conversation with the woman at the well. They, they were sent ahead to get supplies, okay? Now, they were in the village. How many people did they bring to Jesus? I mean, how many people did they bring back to introduce to? None! Not one per they didn't bring one person, right? And now here, this lowly, rejected, and despised woman, she's bringing the entire village to Jesus Christ, right? She's an hour old in the Lord for crying out loud, and she's just schooled the disciples in evangelism. And so we had, friends, this striking object lesson in this idea as Sarah alluded to, that you don't need to be some ivory tower Bible scholar to be used of the Lord. I know a lot of people who are very, very puffed up with pride concerning themselves and the Bible, and there's no fruit. You don't have to be some ivory tower Bible scholar to be used to the Lord. All we are on the hook for is to simply share what God has done in your life. That's it. And so she does just that. She shares what Christ has done for her. And now the entire village has uh, come to the Lord. And so that's the scene now where we pick it up tonight in verse 40. All right, so then digging in then and picking it up in verse 40, we read Tony Joe 40 to 42. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. All right, let's underline because of his word in verse 41. Because of his word, or because of his words, all right? Now, Jesus hangs out for a couple of days, and we're told many more come to him. And again, it all started with this once deplorable human being, right? Immediately used, immediately activated to bring people to Jesus Christ. Now, how did she do that? How? Was it with a slick ad campaign? You know, was it, was it through a well-thought-out marketing research plan? I mean, she simply said, hey, you got to meet this guy that totally changed my life. Okay, Now, some of you remember back in Acts chapter 3, not too long ago, Acts chapter 3, the Jewish leaders, man, they were torqued off that Peter and John healed this lame man in the name of Jesus. They brought Peter and John and the lame man before the judges, and uh, um, they said, how, by what name, by what power have you guys done this thing, Acts 4, 7? And Peter said, uh... Remember that guy you crucified? Yeah, he did it. Right? And then we read of these Jewish leaders that that seeing the boldness of the apostles and seeing the lame man with them, that they could say nothing against it. Acts 4.14. What could they say? I mean, you naughty little disciples, this crippled man can walk. I mean, how can you, you can't be negative at all. The lame man walked. And the result that was brought forth there was 5,000 peeps coming to Christ, right? Acts 4.4. There's your marketing, okay? Now, there's all kinds of marketing ministries out. Well, they call themselves marketing ministries, but they're businesses, and and they're in the business of growing the church, and they'll come in, and and they'll do a customized marketing plan for you, and and they'll put together a video or a brochure of of some sort, and, and then for a small fortune... 
They'll send it to every house in a particular zip code in order to begin to market your church in the community. The only thing that we need to market any church is for people to see changed lives, right? That's what happened in Acts chapter 4 with the lame guy, and that's what got the attention of these folks in Samaria. Here is this woman. She's suddenly talking to everybody before running into Christ, you remember. She never talked to anybody. In fact, we learned in the past couple of weeks, we discovered what? She went to the well to draw water at precisely the time when the probability was the very lowest that she'd run into, so she didn't have to talk to anybody. And now here she is talking to everybody, this despised loner who went way out of her way to keep to herself. Suddenly she's out in the open air beckoning to the masses, right? What the church needs more than anything else is more lame men walking and more changed women talking. Okay? If, you, if we want to be used to our full capacity, man, we just allow the Lord to begin to change our lives. Now, a lot of times we'll say, though maybe we won't verbalize it, but in the back of our minds we're thinking, well, well I can't be used. I've got issues, man. I, you know, I've got some real problems I'm dealing with. I can't, can't be used of God. I've got to get my ducks in a row. When you go through the scripture, would you please find one man or woman of God that, did, that was used of God that didn't have an issue? I mean, you can't even get out of Genesis and you've got a very, very long list of boneheads, do you not? I mean, you've got Abraham, right? The, the not-so-faithful father of the faith. He's going into Egypt, and he tells Sarah, you know, you're totally hot. Man, you're smoking, and Pharaoh's going to see you. He's going to want to kill me. So let's say you're my sister. <laughs> uh, come on. Eh? I'm not making this up. Genesis 12, 11 and 12. That didn't work out too well for the guy, but he didn't learn his lesson. He turned right around and did it again in Genesis 20. And then you've got Noah, right? He hits the sauce a little too hard, gets a little tanked, he takes his pants off. Genesis 9, 21, kids got to cover up dad. What's going on there, right? Again, I'm not making this stuff up. Will you please find one man or one woman that was used of God that did not have an issue? You've got Moses the murderer, you've got Rahab the harlot, you've got Gideon the chicken hearted, you know, you've got David the adulterer, did I mention him already? And man, the list just goes on and on and on. Now, why has God, do you suppose, sought to use the weak and feeble among us? As a matter of fact, that's why God's not using some of you because you don't understand that you are weak and feeble and you know who you are, okay? Why has God sought to use the weak and feeble among us? So that when God's power is demonstrated among the weak and feeble, it is the Lord that gets the glory. It is God that gets all the credit. It is, it is the Lord that gets all the praise, right? Not the vessel to whom God is using. Make sense? Now here is a woman, messed up life, and yet God has used her in fantastic fashion. You and I, again, we ought to derive a tremendous level of comfort from the kinds of men and women that God consistently uses throughout his word over and over and over again. Again, we study the Bible verse by verse because you will hit every topic conceivable. And not just that, but again, you will hit every topic conceivable with the frequency with which God would have you to hit those topics, right? And one of the things that the Lord has pounded home with tremendous regularity is that God uses deeply flawed boneheads like you and me. Okay? Now, Let's mark 40, uh, verse 41 again very carefully there. Notice the Samaritans believed. I had you underline this because of his word. You can ask me about this in the Q&A later, but you want to have a word-for-word -word translation when you're studying verse by verse, okay? New King James, NIV, 
NASB, ESV. If you have a New Living Translation here, it's kind of like uh, going to a gunfight with a knife. You're not going to see some of the stuff here. And it's a paraphrase. Good translation, but it's a paraphrase. Make sure you have a word-for-word -word translation. Anyway, notice we're told they believe because of his word. I want you to hold on to that because we're going to get to a group of people here in a bit that did not take Christ at his word, right? They're going to need a little something, something else to believe, okay? Hold on to that. These guys believe because of his word. Now, notice also in verse 42, underline world there at the end of the verse, world, okay? Notice that these guys have come, the Samaritans here, they've come to the conclusion that this guy, not just here to save the Jews, but he's here to save the entire world. So the Holy Spirit has revealed to these guys that he's the savior of the entire world. Do you see that? Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to heaven and hell is canceled, all right? Okay? But it simply means that Christ, through his sacrifice, he's now made available to all people a right relationship, a right standing before the God of the universe. Again, 2 Peter 3, 9. God desires all men would come to a knowledge of him. Right? He desires all men would choose him. And if, because of the hardness of our hearts, by the way, in our own willfulness, we refuse to do that. We refuse to come to him. Well, that's not God's problem. That's ours. Christ has opened the door uh, for all of us. We just need to choose that door. All right. Well, then we read, picking it up in verse 43, and Tony Joe, 43 to 45. After the two days, he went forth from there into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. All right, well, again, you remember the promised land, divided kind of into three regions. You had Galilee in the north, you had Judea in the south, and, and Samaria there in the middle. Now, Christ's hometown was in Nazareth, in Galilee, okay? So Galilee was his home region. Nazareth, uh, Nazareth was his hometown. Now, Jesus says here in verse 44 what we've heard before, right? That a prophet has no honor in his own country. Bible students, that takes you to Luke chapter 4, okay? It's a reference to Luke chapter 4. Now, you remember there, one day Christ goes into the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, he opens up Isaiah 61, and he begins to read the first couple of verses of Isaiah 61. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set the prisoners free and proclaim the year of the Lord. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Now, the Jews that were there, they're listening to Christ read this, and they're thinking, yep, that's Isaiah 61, Jesus. Good job. Preach it, brother. But then he had to go and say, today in your hearing, the scriptures are fulfilled. I am the fulfillment of those verses, Luke 4, 21. Well, the Jews blew a gasket or two after he said that, right? I mean, they couldn't receive it. Is this not Joseph the carpenter's son? I mean, aren't his brothers and sisters among us? I mean, this guy can't be the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. They were so enraged by it. So offended by it, they tried to kill him. They tried to push the guy literally over a cliff, Luke 4, 29. Now, here he is. Things are going good. He's being very well received in Samaria. He's hanging out for a couple of days there, right? Verse 43. No doubt enjoying some wonderful fellowship there and, and no doubt just enjoying the fruits of the harvest and the fruits of success there. Why in the world would he want to go back to Galilee? I wouldn't. I'd at least want to stay there more than two days, a couple of weeks, month. Why in the world would we want to go back to where he was dishonored? Tremendous question, and the answer to this question is wonderful. I want you to stay with me, okay? The answer to the question, why in the world would he want to go back to Galilee, can be found in Matthew 4. Now, you've got the verses in your study guide. You can look at that later. 
But when in Matthew 4, we read that he went into Galilee of the Gentiles so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, that there would be a light shining in this dark place. Matthew 4, 12 to 16, quoting Isaiah 9. Okay? Now, listen very carefully. Matthew 4 tells us very carefully he went into Galilee of the Gentiles so what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet would be fulfilled. Matthew 4 tells us very carefully that Christ went into Galilee because he understood what the word said about his ministry. Are you catching that? Okay? Listen. The scriptures to Christ were more than just prophetic. They were more than just predictive. They were directive. Okay? Christ goes to the word of God here for direction concerning his ministry. Now, again, it would have been easy for him to stay where the good times were, right? Where the success was, let the good times roll, right? And so he leaves this happy scene down here in Samaria to go to a place where he has no honor. Why did he do that? Because he allowed the word of God to direct his ministry. Okay? What an incredible lesson for you and I. What tremendous insight, right? I mean, that you and I are to allow the word of God to direct our steps, to determine our paths, Psalm 119, 105. Not the wisdom of men, mind you. Not the wisdom of men, but the word of God. Way too often, we take our ministerial direction, if you will, or, or, or our opportunities to serve from pastors or, or other Christians. Well, you know, you'd be good at this. Why don't you try this? And, and you should go this way. And boy, I, I really see that. Go to the word of God, okay, to allow your ministry and your efforts to be directed. Now, Proverbs, you say, or you may say, tells me, well, there's wisdom in the counsel of multitude. There's, there's wisdom in the conferring with a number of men, right? Indeed, there is. Here's the tricky part. Make sure that the counsel that you are receiving is coming from men and women who take their directives and take their directives, not from other men, but from the word of God. It's the most serious word I could give you tonight. Make sure the counsel that you are receiving is coming from men and women that have a very real handle on the word of God, not what's popular. Not what what everybody else is doing. Not following men, all right? Make sure the counsel that you're getting is coming from men and women that have a very, very strong handle on the word of God. This is no small point, friends. So here's Christ. He's not seeking to please himself, but he allows the word of God to direct the ministry. There's something for you Bible students to chew on. The word is directed by the word. All right, now, where in Galilee does he go? Notice picking it up in verse 46 And Tony, Joe, if you could read 46 and 47. Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Whoa. Now, there's so much for you Bible students to chew on this week. He returns to the same place he was just two chapters ago, right? There at Cana. We're told very deliberately where he turned the water into wine. You remember there was a wedding feast there, John 2.9. There's no small, and and some of the the things, guys, I want to give you some room to chew on this week. Uh, This is one of those opportunities. I'm not going to run with this too far, but there's no small point being made here by the Holy Spirit in informing us where this next miracle is to take place here, right? You see, now you've got these two deals lined up side by side. The Holy Spirit often does that in order that we might notice something, all right? In John 2, you remember, we had a celebration, right? Wedding feast. Here we're about to discover devastation, as you've already seen there in verse 47. So whether it's a wedding or a funeral, whether whether it's celebration or devastation, Christ is the one that can be counted on. It is no accident that these two deals are lined up here. We're to connect them, chew on that this week. Now, 
But man, I want to be in him when trouble hits because I want his peace. I want his eternal perspective. He told us, man, when trouble comes, your peace is in me. All right? Now, the Jews had a saying for this. They said, you know, the black camel of sorrow will kneel at every man's gate. Every one of us at some point in our lives, we're going to lose somebody that's very dear to us. Many of us already have. We need to be in Christ for that man. Okay? Now, here's a guy, pretty insulated, right? But now all of a sudden, desperation sets in. And the interesting thing is, here's a man who comes to Christ in a crisis. In other words, it is a crisis that is driving him to Christ. Now, many people come to um, Jesus through a crisis, right? Maybe some of you have committed your lives to the Lord because of a crisis. It has been said, friends, that lost people change for one of two reasons. Either out of anger or out of fear. Okay? And the idea there is you're either mad at how your life is is and, and you're seeking change or you're afraid of what your life has become or will become, and, and so you seek change. And so for many of the lost, if they're not changing, it's because they're not angry enough or they're not fearful enough about what's going on in their lives. Now, once you're saved, of course, right? I mean, once you've come to an understanding of, of the great love of Christ and you've spent time in his word, really coming to know him, really developing a real relationship with him, fear or anger are no longer the agents through which we desire change, right? But rather love is, okay? Then we desire to grow and to change in order to please the one that we've come to such a wonderful understanding of. Uh, That's just done so much for us. But for the lost, the agent of change is usually anger or fear. This cat is now very afraid. All right? And so he is seeking change. He is doing something that he never would have done before. He never would have come to Christ had it not been for this desperate situation. Now, the problem is if you come to the Lord based upon crisis and you do not allow the Lord to move you from a a, uh, um, a crisis faith to a deeper faith, to a deeper relationship with him, to a deeper level, then as soon as the crisis is over, your faith is too, right? I mean, you see a lot of people get very religious during a crisis. I mean, you'll see them every time the doors at church, you'll see them at church every time the doors are open, right? But then when the storm clouds begin to pass and the sun begins to break forth upon the horizon of their lives, you don't see them at church anymore, right? Again, this is why discipleship is so important, guys. The Lord will always, constantly use crisis to get the attention of the lost. But here's what's happening today. And I'm not going to give you statistics, okay? I'm not a statistics guy, but they are telling, okay? Here's what happens. The Lord uses crisis to get the attention of the lost. We're supposed to co-labor with him. Okay, guys, join me in this deal. But then, after the crisis, he's brought them into the body of Christ, and they wind up at a church that doesn't elevate the word of God to its proper place. They never really get grounded in his word. They're not growing roots deep enough to keep them there when the sun comes out again, and it's off to the beaches of the world again. Okay, what is God's word for you and I tonight? When we have a brother or sister that is introduced into the body of Christ, we need to introduce them right away into the word of God. That's the program we need to be running. Okay, you remember God says he holds his word above even his own name. Are you kidding me? Psalm 138 verse 2 for you Bible students, you have magnified your word above your own name. Very powerful scripture there for you to, uh, Bible students to chew on as well. So this guy, very critical junction, he has come to Christ in the midst of a crisis. And Christ now wants to move him from just a crisis faith to a saving faith, to a deeper faith, you see. Now, 
Notice how tactfully and how gently Christ moves him along, picking it up in verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Were you the only one that picked up on that? Okay. Do you see how tactful and gentle Christ was there? Unless you see people's lines and wonders, you're not. I mean, how's that for a kick in the teeth? Right? I mean, your baby boy is about ready to die. You've just traveled 18 to 20 miles to come to Christ. And you're saying, well, you know, now my, my son's at death's door and, and I need you to do something. And Jesus says, well, unless you see a magic trick, you're not going to believe. I mean, could you imagine calling me this week? And saying, John, I, I, I really need you to pray for me. I mean, there's this, this terrible thing going on. And for me to answer you, well, unless you see a sign or a miracle, you, I mean, you'd be very offended at that, would you not? What's going on here? Well, the word you here in the Greek is plural, okay? He's not addressing this to an individual. This is being spoke, is spoken to a large number of people. He is addressing the Galilean Jews. Okay, Now, the Galilean Jews, you remember they were in Jerusalem for the Passover where we studied back in chapter 2. Some of you guys remember that very powerful lesson. They saw Jesus pulling rabbits out of his hat left and right, right? And you remember, of these people, Jesus said, I am not going to commit to this bunch because they're not committing to me. John 2, 23 and 24, they're committing to the miracles. I'm not going to commit myself to them. Remember that? The end of John 2. And so here he is, back in his home region, so to speak, and they give him a hero's welcome because they want to see more of this stuff going on, right? Now, really listen. Here in the Galilean Jews, we have a group of people who are relating to God on the basis of sight. They are not walking by faith. They are walking by sight. What did the Apostle Paul say to the church at Corinth? We are to walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. These guys that Christ is addressing here, they have sight faith. All right? They have signs and wonders faith. Now the problem with walking by sight... Listen, listen, seriously. The problem, guys, with walking by sight is that it inherently creates a greater need for us to see and experience more things. If somehow... <laughs> all right. If somehow my faith in Christ is predicated upon me seeing him do some wondrous sign... Well then, if it's been a week or two since I've seen a leg lengthening surface, well, well, you know what's wrong with God? Is God dead? I mean, you know, is God not like me anymore? Is God just grabbed Elvis and left the building? I mean, what, what's going on here? The reason the Word of God, t listen, the reason the Word of God tells us we are to walk by faith, not by sight, is because the Bible says when we walk by sight, what is being bred within our hearts is the need to see and experience more and more. And people can swerve into some pretty ridiculous tracks and ridiculous cycles there. I'll tell you what, man, you need to know this, okay? giving it to you straight. The enemy will be very, very quick to jump in here if the water's warm, all right? If he's got a brother or he's got a group of brothers or he's got a leader or two that he knows does not have a real handle on the word of God. Listen, he's been counterfeiting the Lord for thousands of years. You remember back in Exodus, Moses had Aaron throw down his rod and do some pretty cool stuff. And then Pharaoh sorcerers, they took their rods, they did the same thing. They counterfeited it, right? Exodus 7. And man, is he ever stepping it up today. Paul tells, us, tells the church at Thessalonica, look. In these last days, you are going to see the devil do lying signs and wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. Well, why would he do that, you say? Why would he do that? Very simple. Two reasons. 
Number one, he wants to lure sheep that are not being fed the word of God into walking by sight. Number two, he wants to lure sheep that are not being fed the word of God into the here and right now, not the there and then, okay? God wants us to focus in his word upon eternal things. Colossians 3, 2, right? Keep your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. Understand this, friends, that the enemy does not want you to be focused upon eternity, and he does not want you walking by faith. He wants you focused on the here and now, walking by sight. And he'll be happy to wow you if he can achieve that objective. Do you understand that? His desire is to get you to walk by sight, weaken your faith, weaken your trust in God, so that when the storm hits, he can take you out. This is serious stuff. Don't be duped. Jesus himself said, I'll have that discourse, Matthew 24. False prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to deceive the elect. That's you. Okay? Matthew 24, 24. Does it get any clearer than that? Listen. What the Lord wants to move you and I towards is a faith that trusts in him whether we see signs and wonders or not. And he'll do wonderful things. I've experienced wonderful things. My wife has many of you. Signs and wonders follow believers. Mark 16, 20. But we are not to follow signs and wonders. Do you see the difference? All right? Here's the deal. Let's bring this home. Okay? Let me back up. And so God wants to move us towards his faith, whether we see it or not, right? And thus, I think in verse 48, in my opinion, there's a little attitude here, right? Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Here's the deal, guys. Let's bring it home. If you, listen, if you have a sight-based relationship with someone, if you have a sight-based relationship with someone, you have at the core a lack of trust, okay? Okay? If you've got to hire a private investigator to follow around your wife or your spouse or your husband or your boyfriend or girlfriend, well, i got to keep an eye on them, man. i I got to know what they're doing every minute of the hour. You do not have a trusting relationship. When you have a sight-based relationship, you have at the core of that relationship a severe lack of trust, okay? Now, guys, I don't want you to be be deceived because there is a lot of crap out there that wants to seduce you into walking by sight and thinking about the here and right now, okay? That wants to appeal to your emotions, and the fruit of that is going to be a lack of trust and a weakening of your faith. And, man, this is not, not good, okay? Are you getting a hold of this? Are you with me? All right. And so these people in Galilee, they'll believe God as long as God is impressing them and entertaining them with all of these miracles. Well, notice how this guy responds. This is classic. I love this guy's response in verse 49. Uh, Tony Joe, just verse 49. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. (laughs) I love it. This guy's response. Jesus is saying, unless you people see signs. And he says, "Uh, Sir, come down before my child dies. He's saying, you know, could we save the sermon? I mean, I don't know about all this stuff. You know, we Gentiles, we don't do the Passover. All I know is my kid's at death's door, all right? Now, he does two things. He, first of all, what he does right here is he casts his care upon the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7, right? He's giving his prayer request to the Lord. Hey, great, awesome, wonderful. The second thing that he does, though, and this is what you and I oftentimes do, I know I do, I did today, is, is he then gives Jesus instruction on what, he's gonna, what he should do. Now, the Holy Spirit furnishes us with a, a level of detail here in order that we might search the scriptures and make the connection between this guy and that famous account of the Roman centurion in Matthew 8. You remember that story, right? Centurion comes to Jesus, and he 
He simply says, would you heal my servant? Remember that story? Jesus says, okay, I'll go to him. And he says, oh, no, 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 no that's not necessary. I, I know a little thing about authority or two. And I'm a man under authority. I know you are. Just speak the word, and I, and I know it will be done. Matthew 8, right? Now, what do we know about these two guys? This guy here and this Roman centurion. Number one, obviously, they're both men. They're both Gentiles. We're told they're both from Capernaum. They're both men of position. They're both men of prominence. And they both came to Christ on behalf of a sick member of their household. All right? So the Holy Spirit would have us search the scriptures, make the connection, in order to notice a very important point of contrast. This nobleman here, he says, look, my son is sick, and this is how I got it planned out, man. Here's how we're going to do it. You've got to come with me, and then he'll be healed. Compare that with the centurion. He basically went to Jesus and said, look, this guy's sick. Take care of it any way you want. Right? Is it not true that the greater part of our prayer life is not laying out our problems before God, but rather giving him instruction and strategy on how to deal with them? You know, well, Lord, I've got a lot of bills spread out here on the table, and, you know, here's my checkbook over here. And as you can see, Lord, I mean, the the sum total of all these bills laid out here, well, that's greater than that total over there in the checkbook checkbook here. So Lord, you know, the way I got it figured out is this. I mean, if you could have those little ping pong balls fly up those glass tubes and align those numbers with the numbers that I've got on my ticket, then Lord, everything's going to be awesome. We'll be okay. All right. Oh yeah. Amen. Uh, In Jesus name. Amen. (laughs) It's important for us to just cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. It's not my responsibility to instruct him. It is not my responsibility to give the all-knowing, omniscient God strategies. Okay? We are simply to pray, Lord, here are my cares. Here are my struggles. Man, this is what I'm dealing with. And I'm just giving these cares to you now. And I I trust that that you know what's best for me from an eternal perspective. I'm pretty short-sighted. So here's my cares. And, and by the way, Lord, could you teach me what's going on here with this? Is there something I can learn while this is going on? Search my heart, Lord. That's it. Okay? All right. Well, then finally tonight, and by the way, this is astonishing to me. Notice how the whole deal turns out as we take it home now, picking it up in verse 50, Tony Joe 50 to 54. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. All right, wow, wow. Well, Jesus has moved this guy from crisis faith to confident faith. And notice the reason for it is not because he's seen a miracle, right? It's not because he's seen signs and wonders. Mark it very carefully in verse 50, guys, right? He believed the word of God. He believed the word that Jesus spoke. He didn't even see it, all right? You remember Paul told the Romans, right? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by seeing miracles. Oh, wait, that's not how it goes. Let's try that again. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by? The word of God, amen, all right? This man was basing his faith not upon what he saw, but he was basing his faith upon the word of God. He was basing his faith upon what he believed, which is God can't lie, this is his word, all right? Now, here's where it gets interesting. The guy didn't go home. Guy didn't go straight home. Now, you would have thought that would have been the plan, Right? Last time I saw my son, he was at death's door. This guy's saying that he's healed. I better rush right back there and, and race home to make sure, right? Now, we have some very striking details before us. We're told in verse 52 that yesterday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, his fever left him. 
Therefore, we know that the conversation he had with Christ happened the day before, verse 51 and 52, at 1 in the afternoon. Some of your translations say the seventh hour. In the Jewish day planner, that's 1 in the afternoon. Okay? So this happened the day before. Now, this guy, he's a political official, right? He's a, he's a man of means. I mean, we would assume that he was either riding in a chariot or what? On a horse, okay? We also know that Cana is about 18 to 20 miles from Capernaum. Furthermore, we know that Cana is 1,000 feet above sea level and Capernaum is 600 feet below sea level. So within this 18 to 20 mile trek, man, it's all downhill. Okay, you're dropping 1,600 feet. Listen, if the dude walked, he would have been there in four or five hours downhill without breaking a whole lot of sweat. And then, of course, if you're on a horse or you're in a chariot, it's going to be even faster, right? The guy didn't go straight home. He took Christ at his word. Are you hearing that? He took Christ at his word. Where's Christ's word right now? Right before you and hopefully in your heart. Okay? So this guy's position is, look, I know my son is here. I don't have to rush home for any reason. What is being laid out here is simply the faith that the man had in Christ. He has moved from crisis faith to confident faith, you see. And then verse 53 takes it a step further. He shares a story with his family. And now not just him, but, but his entire family believes. So the man has been moved from crisis faith to confident faith, to contagious faith. Right? You see that? Amazing. Amazing. In closing, friends, we've discovered a a, a number of very, very interesting things tonight. But the impression that I want to leave you with, the impression upon my heart as I studied this was this. That we are, did you see this tragedy that the Lord used here. We saw the celebration. Now we saw the devastation. I am, you know, I, friends, we, I am convinced we are in no position to judge what it is that God is doing in our lives this side of the resurrection. I am an incredibly short-sighted individual. I can barely see the nose off the front of my face. We are an incredibly short-sighted people, Okay. We just do not have all of eternity in view, okay? And we have an enemy who will do whatever he can to weaken your faith and take you out to keep your focus off the eternal landscape and upon the here and now. We have an enemy that desires we would walk by sight at whatever cost, and he will wow you in order to do that. You better make sure the counsel you're getting from people are people that are firmly entrenched in the word of God, all right? Because if the enemy, if he can weaken your faith, he's going to either take you out or severely stunt your growth, limiting your effectiveness in the kingdom. Okay? But when we come to an understanding that God desires to build within us this, this walking by faith, when we come to an understanding that God desires us to walk by faith, things are going to begin to come into focus. Things are going to become clearer. Images that were a little cloudy are going to start aligning themselves. They're going to make sense. Your perspective is going to grow. Listen, I I like to think of it this way because I'm a simple guy, all right? If we can't walk by faith, if I can't trust God here for a few decades, how then am I to trust him for all of eternity and beyond? Right? Do you understand that? I mean, if you can't trust God for a relatively short period of time here, how are you going to trust him with all of your eternity? You can't trust him here. How are you going to trust him there? Right? How do you do that? You see, faith is the language of eternity, friends. Faith is the language of eternity. You might be here 70, 80, 90 years at best, but faith is the language that you're going to need to develop in order to navigate the counsels of eternity and forever and beyond. 
And so it would be, in my humble opinion, a galactic understatement to say that it's important that we begin to move in that and develop that and walk in that faith now. Okay? Now, the story of this nobleman very well may not end here. We don't know for sure, and it really doesn't impact the whole deal a whole lot, but it is interesting to to speculate. That's what this is, speculation, nothing more. But the story of this nobleman may not end here. Now, you remember our study of Acts chapter 13 not too long ago. You got Paul and Barnabas, Sunday school teachers in Antioch, right? And the church of Antioch had a number of men who were prophets who were speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Acts 13, 4. And there comes to these men the understanding by the Spirit that Paul and Barnabas, these two Sunday school teachers, are to be commissioned to be sent forth out into the Roman Empire and to begin what turns out to be the world missions movement. All right? And one of the interesting things is, is that one of the prophets who was there in the church at Antioch was Menaean. Acts 13, verse 1. Who was Menaean? We're told in that same verse, the foster brother of King Herod. Okay? Now, this is another a number of Bible, uh, this is another study, but there are a number of Bible scholars that believe it is a reasonably possible idea that the Menaean in Acts chapter 13 is the very same unnamed nobleman here in John chapter 4. Is it not interesting? Here is a father. And what could be more desperate than your little boy at death's door? Imagine that. I mean, I'm sure there were people that were saying, oh, man, this is, man, this, why does this have to happen? That, that nothing, this is the most terrible, this is the worst thing in the world. I mean, what could be more tragic than this? And yet, listen, God purposely allowed this situation to happen to this family in order that it would bring this man into a relationship with Christ in order that it would bring his whole family into a relationship with Christ, world without end. And and it may have have ultimately opened the door for world missions through which the entire planet was changed because of the sending forth of Barnabas and Paul. I am convinced we are in no condition, we are in no place to judge anything on this side of the resurrection. We're so quick to say, "Well, well, this isn't fair. And this isn't right, and and this is a terrible thing, and I don't know why God's being so mean to me. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, you cannot judge anything before it's time. It is not our responsibility to be able to answer all of the whys, okay? It is our responsibility to simply trust God in every situation. Difficult times are coming. We need to be in the work. We need to be ready for that. We need to develop, not only from an eternal perspective, the language of faith, but right here and now we're going to need that. Okay? And you've got an enemy that wants to weaken your ability to operate in that language. Okay? We are to simply trust God in every situation. That's why it is no accident, no accident, that the, and you've heard it here before, the most oft-repeated command cover to cover in the Bible is don't be afraid. The second most oft-repeated command cover to cover in the Bible is trust in me. Are you getting the message? Don't be afraid. Trust in me. You're going to need this language of faith to move through all of eternity with. You've got the world, the flesh, and the devil. You've got three enemies that are going to weaken your faith. You be discerning. You rightly divide the word of truth. You make sure that the men and women that are leading you have a firm handle on the counsel of God because eternity is a very, very, very serious thing to walk into misled, man. All right? You see, the word of God promises us that one day we will look at all that God has done and we will call it good. Okay? You ju- Look at this guy's life, man. What God did, you just don't know what God is going to do in your life. You don't know what we interpret as being a crisis isn't being used by God to usher in some tremendous thing. You don't know what God is going to do in your life. 
But you do know this for sure, that he has your all of, of your eternity in view. Okay? The only thing that I'm responsible to do is to walk as a lame man that has been healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. Time and time again, we are blessed. We are brought into a clarity of understanding and a world of religious confusion today. God, I pray that you would continue to just cause hearts to, to develop their ability to trust you. Lord, teach us how to walk by faith. We know that you use trials and tribulations to move us along and to, to grow our ability to walk by faith. And God, thank you for that because we know that you are building in us an eternal being, that you're doing in us an eternal work. God, give us your perspective. We're so flawed. We're so deeply flawed. We're so prideful. We're so silly. Lord, thank you that your mercies are new every day. Lead us into your truth and your love so that we might have your peace and your joy and your perspective. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. That's John 4.